Hi guys, Katie here, uh, module six discussion. Um, so I chose for chapter nine, question one and two. Question one is discuss and differentiate between groups and teams in terms of both development and performance. Um, so a group is kind of a, a vague term can relate to like a large group of people or a small group of people, but a team is several individuals working individually to contribute to a team's collective outcome. So in teams, people want to discuss and solve problems, but in groups, there's not as much need for communication. It's mainly just information sharing. Um, groups also have an emphasis on goals for each individual, but not necessarily the the overall group's goal or team's goal. Um, so teams is definitely more group goal oriented, which is kind of confusing if you put it that way. Um, this is all discussed on page 261. I was trying to think of a really good way to kind of explain teamwork. And so I thought of like fast food, my kiddo works at Taco Bell. And a really easy way to describe it is teamwork in a fast food restaurant, every team member's goal is to get the customer their food. So you have the person taking their order, the person who takes their money, they put that order up on the screen, the kitchen then knows what the order is that they need to make, the food they need to create, then get that to somebody else to bag it up and get their drink and hand it out the window. So everybody is working on the one group goal or team goal of getting that customer their food. Um, so obviously they do that hundreds of times a day, but overall, every individual is doing their job to contribute to the team's overall goal. Um, and then question two, how do models of group development and team performance help you better understand groups or, um, excuse me, and group dynamics? Can you think of a time when this information may have been useful for you in the past? So when I was working on my RRP and reading about Tuckman's model of groups on page 261 and 262, I started thinking about some experiences I've had in the past at like conferences that I've gone to where you are basically around a bunch of strangers who are all there to learn about the same new product or, you know, learning some some sort of new plan or what whatever whatever the conference is about so you don't really know anybody but you're all there for the same common goal and so a lot of times at these conferences they break you out into breakout sessions where you're in these small groups of people you don't know and you're kind of getting a feel for the climate you're in that forming stage where you're getting to know people and you're starting to work on this project or exercise. So it's super awkward. It's quiet at the beginning in that forming stage. And then you start talking, getting to know one another. You kind of move on to the storming phase where you're trying to figure out, you know, who's who and who can contribute what to the group and who the leader should be. Um, and as you start talking and moving through that phase and you figure out who the leader is, then you move on. Um, let's see here, past the competition and eventually the leader is picked. Now you're in the norming stage where everyone kind of gets to know each other. The communication is built. There's some camaraderie going on um, and you start working towards those shared goals and determining, you know, okay, in the storming phase, we learned that you're really good at creativity and you're really good at this and you're really good at that. And so you get through all of that and now you're finally in the performing stage and everybody's kind of working towards this root objective that they have from this breakout session. <clears throat> so that's what it reminded me of. I thought it was a really good example of using the group uh, models of groups in a real life scenario. Um, and I think it probably could have worked to think of things that way too, to know that, you know, it's not going to be awkward the whole time. <laughs> you will get through that first initial few stages and then it'll move on and the group will start producing that objective. <clears throat> For chapter 10, discuss effective employee recruitment. Um, effective employee recruitment can be really difficult. The text points out that you have the possibility of the potential employee misrepresenting themselves, which usually ends up backfiring on the company. Um, rehiring is super expensive and it's not fun. The first stage of recruitment is determining what the objectives are for the posting you're trying 
for which you're trying to hire? Who are you looking to fill the position? What are the skills? What is the role they're going to be in? What basically what kind of an applicant do you want? And then the next stage is strategy, which determines how you will find your applicants, who you'll recruit, what is the message you're sending out in that recruitment. Um, and then recruitment activities involves the advertising basically for that job, career fairs, monster, you know, however you're going to get that advertisement out for the job. I've been really lucky whenever I had to hire people, those first three steps have kind of been taken care of for me. There was already defined um, job descriptions. There was already recruitment people or HR specialists that we worked with. I didn't have to really worry about any of that, thankfully. Um, and then, you know, after that, it's pretty much just interviewing. And so that was always kind of my biggest, my biggest role in that was being the interviewer and determining who you were actually going to hire. Um, some of those interviews were horrible. I mean, like you'd be in some interviews and you couldn't wait to open the door because it smelled so bad. Maybe not from stench, maybe from too much perfume. Um, I've been in interviews where applicants skirted around and didn't answer any question I asked them. And I've been in interviews that completely blew my mind that I wondered why this person was applying for the job they're applying for because they were so smart. Um, <clears throat> so when I, a lot of my interviewing came from when I was a call center manager and we used to have our applicants go through the interview process. And then if we thought they might be a good fit, we would have them go sit with one of our existing employees for like 30 minutes to do like an, a mini realistic job preview or RGAP as the book called them. Um, and it really kind of helped the job applicant understand what their role would be. So they didn't come in with this false expectation of what the job would be. And sometimes it kind of weighed, you know, waded through some of those applicants and they didn't end up wanting the job. Um, and I think that was a really good way to eliminate some of those applicants from potentially being hired and then not working out. Um, I think that strategy falls in with one of the self-reflection theories on page 292. Um, so we basically were providing information to the applicants to ensure that that was a job that they really wanted to do. Um, and then question two for chapter 10, use an example from your personal or professional history, explain job lens stages of organizational socialization. Um, so that's broken out into three parts, anticipatory socialization, organizational entry and assimilation, and organizational disengagement or exit. So anticipatory socialization is the time before someone accepts a job with an organization. So there's two different ways that you're socialized. You're socialized in the working world, through your family, um, that sort of thing. So my grandma was... Um, probably my biggest influence. She was a really successful independent woman. She like started as a phone operator at a hospital and then worked her way up to being the personnel director. Um, so as long as I can remember, I wanted to work in healthcare and kind of follow in her footsteps. So when my department was outsourced, I had the opportunity to start over and get my foot in the door in the healthcare industry. <clears throat> um, so part of my socialization came from, and my new company came from one of my old employees, so a peer as well, who was hired by my current employer about six months before I was able to apply. So I had wanted to get into healthcare because of my grandma and then a peer of mine who was also outsourced um, was in that field. So it just kind of worked out. And then of course there's other influences like the media, your education, organizational experiences that you've had, all those things. Um, all um, sorry, I lost my place here. In looking for the organization, determining if the applicant will be a good fit. Okay. Um, and then the pre-entry stage um, was really long for this job that I got. I applied in January. I interviewed in February. Didn't get the job till April. And then the entry was long too. I mean, training was technically four weeks, two classroom, two weeks classroom, and then two weeks on the job. But it really did help me understand the culture and the roles and the processes because the job, the organization has a lot of rules and divisions and it's a really big system to learn. 
Um, so the metamorphosis for me probably didn't happen until about six months after I was hired, which also kind of feels like a long time, but I feel like that was when I really started to fully understand the organization, didn't have to question things as much. Um, and then luckily I haven't gotten to the point of exit in this job and my job prior the exit was really sad because it was due to outsourcing. So, um, I'll move on to the case study real quick here. So two concepts from my assigned chapter and then one from chapter 10. So the concepts for chapter nine that stood out to me was um, definitely the conflict and tension section on page 274. Dante started a lot of conflict and lost a lot of trust when he basically turned on his team at the holiday party. He didn't really consider his feel or their feelings and how his comments would make them feel. He started the conflict basically with his words, which led to tensions on the team. And he didn't really work to figure out why everyone was mad at him, which I thought was kind of strange. He just kept trying to move on and get more work done and didn't focus on trying to figure out what the problem was. It was like the whole time he didn't really understand why everybody was mad at him, but he just dealt with it and moved on um, while everybody else continued to be upset, um, which actually goes back to the beginning of the case study where the VP said, you know, that Dante needs to be a team player to work there. Um, and then I also related the second concept, I guess, from chapter nine would be the self-centered roles on page 279. I think Dante fell into a lot of those categories. So the aggressor, by the way, he basically took everyone else down to make himself look better. Um, recognition seeker a lot throughout the whole case study, it seemed like he was really seeking recognition, both organizational and on a personal level, like when they were out, you know, trying to be the center of attention. Um, and then he could also be seen as a dominator after he upset everyone and tried to control the group by act, just continuing to ask for project information and avoiding the elephant in the room, I guess. <clears throat> and then for chapter 10, what really stood out to me was um, Dante's Metamorphosis, which is mentioned on page 299. So from the new employee to one of the team, <clears throat> this seemed to happen pretty quick for him. And he was, you know, eventually hanging out with him after work. He had built enough trust to talk to them about his personal problems and his relationships. And he was just one of the gang, like they said. Um, so, yeah, that kind of stood out to me for chapter 10. That's all I got. Sorry, another long one this week. Looking forward to hear what you all have to say.